societies, similar histories in some cases, with others, common cultures. For decades, there's been a vision of economic and social unity across this region. And amidst the golden anniversary celebrations of CARICOM, the realization of these aspirations is now an ever-increasing possibility. We will join some very important officials from across the globe who are in attendance at the most recent CARICOM Heads of Government meeting, where several crucial matters, including freedom of movement throughout CARICOM member states, were tackled. Another topic discussed was the issue of Caribbean food security and, as we will see later, food and beverage manufacturers and suppliers have long played an important role in our communities. Speaking of food, we will as always take the opportunity to sample some tasty cuisine, this time from the kitchen of Chris De La Rosa. But first on Caribbean Passport, we touch down in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago for the 45th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting. July 4th, 1973. The leaders of Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Barbados and Guyana have gathered at the Shagaramas Convention Center in Trinidad. Their purpose, another attempt at creating a regional union of nations following the short-lived West Indian Federation and the Caribbean Free Trade Association. 50 years on. And the Caribbean community and common market known as CARICOM, which went into almost immediate effect on August 1st, 1973, has thrived. Not only has this organization been focused on economic issues and the establishment of a free trade zone, but it has also dealt with political, social, security and health matters, plus other challenges within the Caribbean. It has forged economic and political agreements, responded to social crises, and has moved the region closer to the reality of a common market via the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, the CSME. The 50th anniversary celebrations provided a backdrop to the 45th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting in Port of Spain, where representatives of the 15 member states descended upon the Hyatt Regency Trinidad, where they would be joined by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, the President of Rwanda Paul Kagame, and South Korean Prime Minister Han Duk So along with representatives from China and Latin America. event got underway with an official opening ceremony of the Hyatt Hotel, the spotlight was shone on the importance of this particular occasion. On this special celebratory occasion, we can reflect with reverence on the events that transpired in Shagaramas on July 4th, 1973, and pay homage to the foresight our founding fathers had when they laid the foundation upon which this great family of nations was built. I anticipate that there will be many moments of introspection and reflection over the course of the next few days as we take the opportunity to mark this golden anniversary together, side by side. I am particularly delighted to acknowledge the four visionaries who pioneered our regional integration movement with valor and ensured that the original Treaty of Shagaramas was signed on that fateful day. Historians of the future will agree that this celebration took place at a critical juncture in the regional integration movement. Never before have small states faced the broad and deep range of challenges that we face now. From climate change, pandemic, gun crimes and violence, transnational migration issues to insecurity with food supplies, our region has been buffeted by many systemic storms. We must be mindful that the symbols and events of celebration do not serve as a distraction from the substance of the heavy lifting still needed to make our community viable, prosperous, secure, and beneficial to all of its people. The issue of free movement 
non-tariff barriers to trade, reliable and affordable transportation are all fundamental to a truly integrated CARICOM. Colleague heads, we need now to actively pursue creative and affordable partnerships to deliver on the crucial element of integration in the interests of our peoples. The movement of people and goods are the backbone of a successful integration movement. We have done all the studies, and the statistics point us to the favorable outcome of an effective transportation system. A challenge to each of us here assembled is to demonstrate the same level of commitment that the Secretary General has for CARICOM. Let us believe in CARICOM. Take our commitments to and responsibilities in CARICOM seriously. And I'm not here talking about heads. I'm talking about all of us in the Caribbean community must take our responsibility seriously. Let us lift CARICOM up and we just may be pleasantly surprised by the benefits that a focused, united, unified CARICOM can bring to our countries and to the people we each have the honor to serve. This anniversary is a time for critical reflection on the enormous challenges confronting the Caribbean. COVID-19 has destroyed lives and livelihoods. Prices for fuel and food skyrocketed. Debt burdens grew heavier, liquidity dried up, and access to global capital markets worsened dramatically. All the while, the climate emergency continues to escalate, threatening the very existence of small island and low-lying coastal states. I thank Caribbean leaders for your powerful calls for climate justice, advancing global action on loss and damage, investing in renewables, and safeguarding biodiversity, including through the efforts of the indigenous communities. The rain may have been a serious challenge, but the 50th anniversary commemoration event at the Shagaramas Convention Center successfully weathered the storm as the raising of the CARICOM banner and the national flags of its member states eventually gave way to the burial of a time capsule to be sealed for the next 50 years and a tree planting ceremony that was conducted hands-on by the region's leaders. It really is a symbol of our resilience against the backdrop of climate and other challenges that our leaders were determined to go ahead with even the tree planting notwithstanding the, the showers of rain. So I thought symbolically it was, it was quite unique and these certainly will be memorable times for our future. And it was important in celebrating our 50th anniversary of CARICOM to come back to the birthplace and to pay tribute to the five decades of our existence. For the 50 years that CARICOM has been in, in existence, a number of initiatives assisted each of its member states. For example, in a time of disaster, Sedema, with this the Caribbean uh, Emergency Response Committee was established and whenever there's disaster in the region, assistance to that organization is provided to our sister countries. We see the worth of CAFA during the pandemic. They came to our aid. We also have the Caribbean Development Bank. So those institutions born out of this association, which has proven to be very useful to all of us. We have a lot of work still to do. We have a lot of shared experiences now, and we have had shared expressions institutionally arising out of those shared experiences. We see it with coordination of foreign policy to a significant degree. We see it coordination of security to a considerable extent. And we've had some movement on economic integration. All attention was on Dominican Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt, the incoming chairman of CARICOM, as a considerable list of issues was about to be tackled. The whole issue of free movement of people across the board, it should not be an elitist approach, uh, that those at the top can move and those at the bottom can't. Uh, we all want people. If we have an integration movement, then everyone should be able to move freely. The other issue is with regards to the single space. If we really want to have an integration movement, then the single domestic space must be created. 
safety on our streets, support for Haiti, a reliable food supply, and the transformation of the CARICOM single market and economy from dream to reality. These topics and more would occupy the minds of the Caribbean leaders during the remainder of the meeting. We've become too accustomed to the daily stories of violent crimes throughout our communities. Many of the murders have been related to gangs, drug trafficking and organized crime, which have all been buoyed by the flow of firearms throughout the Caribbean. As Secretary of State Blinken arrived in town, further resolutions were made with regards to regional security. One of the key decisions was the appointment of a U.S. coordinator for Caribbean firearms prosecution to go along with the creation of CARICOM's Crime Gun Intelligence Unit. A pledge of support for Haiti, a nation that continues to endure political and social turmoil, involved an agreement on the deployment of a UN-authorized peacekeeping force to assist the Haitian National Police in restoring civic stability. If you send any quantity of food items to Haiti, it will not get to the beneficiaries. And how do we get this? Strengthening the National Police, providing them with resources, providing them with the advice they require, and create that safe corridor so that we can have the resources coming in. So we ameliorate the security situation and we allow the environment to be safe enough to bring in the humanitarian support so that we can have peace and tranquility hope in Haiti and move to the political issues of free and fair elections. With the increase in weather extremes in the Caribbean, including an ever-intensifying Atlantic storm season and high temperatures, climate change is now an undeniable reality. The battle will include the USA's return to the Paris Agreement and the leadership of the Caribbean nations urging the G7 members and other major economies to honor individual commitments to combating climate change. Last year saw the launch of the US-Caribbean partnership to address the Climate Crisis 2030, which is geared towards fostering greater adaptation to climate change and a transition towards clean energy. This includes geothermal projects in Dominica and St. Kitts and Nevis, solar microgrids in St. Lucia, and electric vehicles in Barbados, Jamaica and Suriname. It was also announced that 5.5 million US dollars in aid will be provided to small farmers across the Caribbean as a means of ensuring greater food security. According to a UN report, one in two people in the region cannot afford a healthy diet due to a multitude of factors, such as climate change, the lingering economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the Russian-Ukrainian war. Take the issue of poultry. From 2020 to now, there are three key inputs in terms of feed production, rice, corn, and soya. You had a 100% increase in the cost of rice as an input, and between 65 and 55% in the cost of corn and soya. We as a region, our total forward planning capacity in terms of storage for corn, rice, and soya, we can only store 20% of what we require. So when there is a glut on the market and the prices are low, we cannot make use of that because there is no storage capacity. So we are now pointing these facts out to the private sector so they can now see the viability of investing in the storage facility. And we have a number of countries who are now partnering in relation to this. In every single country, we have seen more investment, more interest, more dynamism, and this is going in the right direction. We're also looking to use technology, looking at hydroponics, looking at aquaculture, high yielding crops. So it is a very, very integrated and holistic plan that seek to justify the rate of return, that seek to rebuild interest. We're also focusing on research and development, the removal of the barriers. So it's a very complex plan to do justice to what we're doing in many of these areas. We've identified the lands in Lairs, in St. Michael in Barbados. The designs for the buildings are completed and I would expect that they should be going in to the planning department and the appropriate studies for environmental impact assessment, etc. are going to be undertaken very shortly to be able to facilitate the planning considerations. 
amidst tributes to CARICOM that were paid from both external and internal sources and the esteemed presence of the organization's long-serving Secretary General, Sir Edwin Carrington, a pledge was made by regional leaders towards the free movement of all CARICOM nationals throughout the community by March 31, 2024. This freedom of movement was a key provision of the CSME, which was first envisioned in 1989 and put into motion by the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, which was signed in 2001. A related issue was maritime and air transportation, with an eye on easier transit throughout the region, while the topic of health was also discussed. Calls were also made for the lifting of US sanctions on Venezuela, an act that would allow the Petrocaribe Agreement to thrive once Venezuela is again able to export its products to Caribbean countries, and a lifting of the decades-long US embargo on Cuba. The end of the final press conference brought the 45th CARICOM Heads of Government meeting to its official conclusion. There is anticipation and hope arising out of the decisions and resolutions that were made in Port of Spain. Once implemented, these policies will make a huge difference in the quality of life in the region as CARICOM begins its second 50-year period of existence. Over 300 years of tradition, a journey from swaying cane fields to ancient stills. The rums produced by Demerara Distillers Limited have a history that began in blazing fire, a cleansing, cane stripped bare, the Caribbean's liquid gold revealed within. It is in this age-old process defined by our ancestors that this legendary spirit is born again. El Dorado, crafted richer, aged deeper. You know, whether it's our well-prepared meals at home or quick bite on the road, we need food for survival and sustenance. A trip to the grocery store confronts one with the ingredients needed for cooking and serving. But the process all starts with those companies that are focused on processing the culinary items that we use on a daily basis. Within the world of gastronomy, Caribbean food holds a place of prominence. Many Caribbean citizens have been applying their talents to exploring and transforming Caribbean foods. From local chefs producing masterpieces of haute cuisine, to ambitious entrepreneurs creating products incorporating indigenous Caribbean ingredients. Recently, the Trinidad and Tobago Supermarket Association masterminded a very special expo designed to highlight Caribbean food and food culture. The Caribbean Food and Beverage event, the first ever trade show of its kind, featured a savory exhibition of the Caribbean's renowned culinary palate. All of this has really been to provide a framework specifically for food and beverage. When you look around this hall, you're going to see a very sector-specific set of actors inside of here. This is a food and beverage forum from within the value chain. Those players have been extracted. This is our opportunity to focus on, from the side of the industry, what we can offer. And let's work towards a more food-secure environment. There has been that impetus and drive of boosting production of food domestically and targeting further investment in the food and beverage sector. And of course, reducing the supply chain difficulties that we've all had to endure, particularly during the unprecedented times of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, defines food security as this phenomenon where all people at all times having physical and economic access, economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious foods that meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy lifestyle. And that is indeed where we want to go. I had a conversation with the president of the supermarket association, Rajiv Dipti, told him, I said, you know, I think that there was a potential to do a Caribbean food and beverage event um, that he had under his umbrella of the supermarket association. He had all the major players. Definitely the response from the food and beverage industry to this particular event was very, very positive. We are looking at 52% of CARICOM people being food insecure. For this reason, we've made the point that this event really has to be looked at in a context of providing food options for people, one. Secondly, it has to be looked at in the context of trying to address some of the causal factors for food insecurity. We highlighted, for instance, that a major causal factor is the high food inflation. Given the large component of our consumption basket that comes from extra regional suppliers. And what we've said is that one way to address this is for us to produce more of our own food. Rising to the challenge of expanding local food production and recognition, entrepreneurs are both emerging and well-established local brands pervaded the expo, showcasing innovative new products, recipes, concepts, always seeking to explore the heritage and culture of Caribbean food production. Right now we're in the, all the major supermarkets in Tobago and we're hoping actually come into this expo to explore the Trinidad supermarkets. I would say that I think it's really important for each and every single one of us to recognize our role in food security and recognizing that it's only through collaboration, through win-win relationships and through understanding that it's not competition, that each and every single one of us as players within the food sector can all benefit. I saw a lot of things here today that really impressed me. This is the first year, so I'm looking forward to seeing it grow in the years coming. As more and more Caribbean food specialists expand their expertise across the region, foodies will doubtless encounter many surprises as they delve into the enduring legacy of Caribbean cuisine. It's all perfect timing as Chef Chris De La Rosa is now here to draw food products from various sources, in this case, the soil and the sea, to create another delectable dish. This recipe, Akian Saltfish Fried Rice, this one takes me back to being a new immigrant in Canada. And you know, most times you hear people talk about the three musketeers. We were the four musketeers, myself, from Trinidad and Tobago, my friend Richard from Jamaica, my friend Alan from Dominica, and my other friend Carlos from Barbados. We stuck together like glue. However, we always gravitated towards Richard's home where grandma, on the weekend, Richard's grandmother, would always make us ackee and saltfish for breakfast. Ackee and saltfish fried rice, give this one a try. You've got some leftover rice in the fridge. It's pretty much the same sort of setup as if you're making ackee and saltfish but we're adding rice to it and making a wonderful one-pot dish. Yeah, check it out, man. I have a tablespoon and a half of coconut oil in my frying pan. I'm using a frying pan, something non-stick, because it allows me to use less oil than, let's say, something that's not non-stick. I have here one cup of prepared salted cod. My heat is on medium-low. Basically, all I did was I soaked it in boiling water, I squeezed it, and then uh, I shredded it. While I have that going on that little sizzle there, I'm gonna go in with some diced bell pepper, and that is just gonna brighten things up and add some more body and everything else to this fried rice. And it's rice that I had left over in the fridge there, and it's about three cups of cooked parboiled brown rice. Any rice you have on hand will work. I'm gonna hit that with a bit of fresh ground black pepper. White pepper is not my thing. I, yeah, so I don't really stock it in the house. It's now time to add some diced onion to the mix. And as that 
onions start to join the fun there. I have some fresh thyme. I just want the baby leaves of the thyme in there. Um, we don't need the sprigs. So all that nice thyme is in there. Full list of ingredients. Just gonna hit that with another quick stir. And I just want that on that gentle heat to sweat down, to soften up the onion and the pepper to help the salted cod do its thing and release its wonderful flavors. With the, the ackee, the ackee came straight out of a can. And being very gentle, I opened the can, I put it into my strainer and I ran cool water through it just to, to get rid of most of that brine and that salt that it's been packaged in. At this point, I'm just gonna clear a little space here and I'm gonna add my crushed garlic and that is homemade crushed garlic. Everything is nice and soft now. The kitchen has the lovely aroma. Yo, I love salt fish. Being very gentle, we're gonna add the ackee to the pot. And with care, we're just gonna sort of fold it because it's very gentle. I turned up my heat to medium high now because there's a tiny bit of water came into the pot here, into the pan when I added the ackee. Now again, you gotta be very gentle here because this can fall apart quickly on you. Now what I'm gonna do is push everything to the side, push it over. I really want to maintain some of the integrity of the aki. I'm just gonna push everything over like so. Turn my heat down to medium low again. I'm gonna push my pot over, my pan over a little bit so this area is directly below the flame. And here's where I'm gonna add my rice. And I'm just gonna squish it down. I want to warm up that rice before we start folding in the ackee and saltfish base that we created there. That there is some mushroom flavored soy sauce that I added. And I'm just gonna mix that up right in here just to give it that sort of Asian twist to a classic Caribbean ackee and saltfish or Jamaican ackee and saltfish. All we're trying to do at this point is to warm through that rice. Here is where now I'm gonna add my scallion to the mix and I like adding it here and then I'm gonna just work that in because I want the onion flavor prevalent in the rice, yeah? I'm gonna shut the stove off now and then give everything a mix to combine because the residual heat in the stove here is enough to finish this off for me. So all you would do is scoop, push, scoop, push. Just being very gentle, just to fold that ackee and sawfish base that we created into everything. Notice how simple that was, and I'm telling you, this is one of the most iconic fried rice you will ever eat. I really hope you enjoyed this dish. See you again on another episode of Caribbean Passport. Back to you, Judy. Thanks, Chris, a true Caribbean dish indeed. Well, once again, we have ended our travels nourished, excited, and informed. As always, we maximize our time at Caribbean Passport, and we do hope that you enjoyed today's trip. Of course, we are always looking forward to having your company for our next episode on Caribbean Passport. Take care. Bye.